Thank you all for being here. We are continuing to work through. Uh, I am a church member. Uh, I do have one copy left if you want to borrow it. Uh, again, I, I'm not selling it, but if you want to borrow it or if you want to buy your own copy, you can. Uh, but we've been working through Tom Renier's book, uh, I Am a Church Member. And this week uh, we are looking at I Will Pray for My Church Leaders. Uh, and we're going to look at why we should pray for our local church leaders uh, and the reasons that we should do that. Uh, the first reason that we need to be praying for our church leaders is because we have an enemy. Uh, and this is also why we should be praying for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, why we should pray for our church family. Uh, because we have an enemy. Uh, as much as we like to think that life is great and life is fine, and as much as we like to put on sometimes uh, that we're okay and there's never any problems that we're having to deal with, that's simply not the case. We have an enemy. Uh, and if we know Jesus Christ, our Lord and personal Savior, that enemy attacks us even greater because if he can turn a Christian away from the faith or get them to live out a bad example of the faith, uh, then he can try to prevent other people from coming to the faith. Uh, we read in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, be sober or have your wits about you. Always be in control of your mental thinking and your, your process, but also be vigilant. Always be on the watch uh, because our adversary is walking around waiting for that moment of weakness waiting for that moment to sneak in and to disrupt things or to try to fight against God. That's the enemy. Uh, now the good news is that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, Christ has given us the victory. But that doesn't mean that there's not still a battle that we face. That doesn't mean that just because we have victory in Christ, we get to walk around and say, well, I don't have to worry about the enemy at all. No, we've still got to put on the armor of God. We've still got to prepare and be sober and be vigilant, as 1 Peter 5 8 tells us to do, so that we're ready when the attack comes. John 10 10 says, The thief cometh not but to, for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Again, this idea that we have an enemy. That there is one who would seek to steal, and seek to kill, and seek to destroy our testimony. Uh, this is the reason we need each other praying for one another. Satan absolutely hates God, and he has done everything and does everything within his power to keep mankind from acknowledging and worshiping God as we are instructed in Scripture. Uh, Satan desires to destroy Christianity. This has been the task he has been at since Christ established the church. And if the purpose of the pastor is to mature the saints for the work of the ministry, and Satan's goal is to stop the work of the ministry, or to stop the work of the church, then anyone who is going to attempt to lead in a church, they automatically have a target on their back. Anybody who is going to encourage someone else to grow in their walk with Christ, to be a faithful and mature believer then Satan's going to be targeting them. Uh, it's kind of like in the military strategy. Uh, if you can take out the 
leader, if you can take out the mastermind of, if you take out the enemy's general, uh, then they've got no one to lead them. And the goal is that chaos ensues, and that then you have an easy military victory. Well, that's Satan's, that's, it, that's what he does. He tries to attack churches individually by attacking individual people within them, but he also tries to take out pastors and church leaders. Because if he can take out them, then he can also take out those who are following them. So we're reminded in Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 12, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're reminded that our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is not another human being. But the battle is spiritual. Therefore, we are instructed to always be in prayer. We read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. He says this is what we've got to do because we recognize the battle that they're going into. If you have a family member or a close friend who's getting ready to go through something serious, how do you pray for them? Well, I... Dear Lord, I pray that you would bless them, and I hope that they're okay. And that's it. Or do we really pray for them? Or, you know my friend here, and you know the battle that they're getting ready to enter into. I pray that you would prepare them. That you would help them to be in your word, that they can know what you have to say, and so that they can be encouraged, so that they can be strong in your truth. And so that they can respond in a way that's pleasing to you as they face that battle. It's an entirely different way of praying. And this is where we're commanded to always constantly be praying for one another. Again, if Satan can take out the leader, the sheep are going to struggle. Uh, this is what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Jesus sees the multitudes as the sheep without a shepherd. How better to discourage the weak than to prevent their leader from being there to encourage and support them. Uh, taking those who are supposed to be strong out of the way, it hinders the weak. If you take out someone who is caring for somebody else, then now there's no one to care for the person they were caring for. And you, you see how it has a crippling effect. Now, in any of this and in all of this, I'm not saying that the pastor or teacher is any more important than any other believer in the church. Uh, please make sure you understand that I'm being clear on this. It's not that if the pastor can't show up, the church can't happen. That's not what we see in Scripture. Because it's very interesting, there were many times and many situations where the leaders in the church were taken out, but God used that as opportunities to develop other leaders to step up and to take the place and to do the task. But that first leader had to be faithful to train faithful men who would teach the word faithfully so that that could take place. It's important that we pray for one another, but also that we pray for our spiritual leaders, that we pray for our pastor, that we pray for our church. 
so that we can grow and we can be who God has called us to be. The other reason to pray, we see it right here, is pray because the task is great. When we look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, Jesus, he's, he has compassion on the multitudes because he sees them scattered as a sh uh, sheep without a shepherd. But then he says to his disciples in verse 37, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He says there is a lot of work that needs to be done, but there are so few who do the work that there's a problem. The laborers are few. There needs to be more laborers. He says then, there, here's the solution to that problem. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. There is so much work to be done between praying for people, studying the word, preaching the word, counseling one another, encouraging one another, lovingly confronting sin, planning things, ministry, at times it's work. Now, it is a joy and a pleasure to be able to minister. But there is work. And Christ said very clearly right here, he says, this is the problem. There's too much to be done and not enough hands to do the work. So pray and ask God, ask the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers. Now, this is a fun one because... Lord, I pray that you would send somebody. I know the task is great, but I pray that you would send somebody. I'm not willing to move a muscle. I'm not willing to get up. I see what needs to be done, but I pray that you would send somebody to do it. Okay, what's wrong with that picture? Okay, if we're going to pray that the Lord would send forth laborers, we've got to pray being willing to go ourselves. Being willing to do ourselves. Lord, there's so many lost people around Telford. There's so many people that need to hear about Jesus. I pray that you'll send them to, to come and ask Pastor Kevin or ask somebody about Jesus. Wait a minute, that's wrong. Yes, you can pray that. But we've got to pray being willing to share the gospel ourselves. This is how Jesus instructed us. He said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers. Well, where are those laborers going to come from? They're going to come from the church. They're going to come from in and amongst ourselves. But what an incredible... Jesus states the problem, but then Jesus also states the answer to the problem. The answer is prayer. That, that we need each other praying for each other. There are so many things that, that will try to take out spiritual leaders. Be it moral failure, be it pride, be it physical problems, be it financial problems, you name it. Satan is there trying to take them out. But that doesn't change the fact that there are people who need to be one to Christ. There are people who need to be discipled, who need to be cared for, and we need more laborers. So God said, pray that more laborers would be sent. But also, that's praying for more workers. You know, it's, it's work. It's, but it's a joyous work. To be able to serve the Lord. It's Christ who does it, works in and through us. And it's amazing to watch him work. It's amazing to watch him transform, transform someone's life. It's amazing to watch him transform my own life as I study and prepare to minister and serve. 
it's an absolute incredible blessing that God gives to pastors and to missionaries and to any that are willing to minister. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Hebrews 13, verse 7. There. Sorry, my pages are not going where they're supposed to today. I'm being a little slow. Hebrews 13, verse 7. He says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Uh, so here we're commanded to remember them and obey them uh, who are over us or who teach the word of God. Uh, verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. So Hebrews 13, 7 and verse 17, uh, we're commanded to remember and then we're commanded to obey. Uh, and this is not saying then that the pastor has unaccountable power over a congregation and just says, all right, you, you go and do my bidding and you obey everything that I say and do. No, it's we obey them in Christ. Uh, as it was back in verse 7, uh, it's remember how they teach the word of God whose faith follow. Follow the example of their faith, considering the end of their conversation or the end of their lifestyle. Watch and observe how they respond to God's word. Watch and observe how they obey God's word and obey God's word likewise. Uh, it, this is not just blindly following a pastor or a leader. It's We've always got to take it back to God's word and say, what does God's word say? If they are faithfully teaching God's word, then do what it says. If they step out of line, if they say something that does not line up with God's word, then we are told to hold them accountable and say, can you show me where you're getting that in the scriptures? But that's where you and I have to be in the scriptures so that you can hold me accountable to teach it correctly and so that I can hold you accountable to follow it also. <coughs> but then verse 17, <coughs> it's obey them that have rule over you. And again, it's not just mindlessly obeying, but it's, it's following the leader that Christ has, following the shepherd that Christ has put over the church. And this isn't that the pastor rules with an iron fist. The pastor is given instructions to lead as a servant or lead as a shepherd would. To watch and to care for your souls. It's a love. It's a, <clears throat> we want to see you grow in Christ. So that's why we try to teach you what God's word says. And you're instructed to do this so that it's a joy and not a grief with you. Uh, there is nothing more frustrating than working with someone, showing someone the truth, and then having them say, yeah, you've told me that, but I'm going to go do what I think is right. And then after they've made the mess of things, coming back, and, having, and, and we're there to pick up the pieces. But it's so difficult because we're sitting there going, if only you had listened back here, it would have been much more profitable for you, much more beneficial for you. Uh, that's, that's part of the pastor's job. Then we're instructed to pray. Not only is the task great, but the qualifications are steep, and they need to be steep. Uh, Christ sets a high standard for his church. That's what he says. Uh, he set a high example. He's God. He lived a sinlessly perfect life. Uh, and we're instructed to be holy as he is holy. Uh, so that's, that's a high standard. 
And by his grace, he gives us the strength to live as we should. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. The job of a pastor, it's a good job. It's a good work. A bishop, which is another name for a pastor, an elder, a teacher. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now, being blameless isn't saying that they're going to be sinlessly perfect. Okay, I want to make sure we're clear there. Uh, because you could take about 30 seconds and you can begin to point out every one of my sins and, and all kinds of things that I'm to blame for, and you'd be right. But generally as a whole, they're supposed to be someone who is growing in Christ faithfully. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, so not someone who's a, who's a drunkard, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So again, there are several warnings to watch out and to help and to pray for your pastor. Because there are many areas in his life, in my life, that Satan <coughs> wants to attack. And we've got to constantly be on guard. But it's also, as we, in the future, as we look for and as we train people to become pastors, these are the things we're looking for. Do they meet the qualifications? Do they do the task? So that's the why. Now let's look at some of the how. You can more effectively pray for your church leaders by focusing specifically on these areas. The first area is simply the area of his family. We read there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Pray for him and pray for his family. Pastors frequently struggle in this area. Balancing family responsibilities as well as church responsibilities. As a church member, you don't always know how many calls your pastor is feeling in a day. Uh, still being a small congregation, uh, you don't have to worry about that quite as much. And I'm not saying don't call me. Please, call me. You can call me more than what you are. Uh, you know. But as the church grows, there will come a time where there's more calls than can be fielded. There's more visits than can be made in a day. You know, so this is something to prepare ourselves to protect and, and guard the pastor's family time. And again, I thank you. I, I'm not standing here saying that you guys are, are, are messing this up at all because you guys are absolutely amazing. And I love to serve you. And, and I think we're, we're doing fairly well on this. Not saying that I couldn't improve because I know... I've got a lot of growing to do still. But pray for the pastor. Pray that they'll be able to have time, quality time with their family during the week. Uh, there are great expectations placed on a pastor and their family. And we need to be an example. We need to lead by example. Uh, and we need to be there for other people. But we are also human. We struggle. Uh, I am not above anybody else's struggles. I am not sinlessly perfect. God is still working on me. The other thing, our family spends a lot of time in church, at church, around the church, and that can, can be a, a, a thing sometimes. 
Uh, you know, pastors' children and pastors' families sometimes struggle because they may overhear someone criticizing the pastor. And I'm not saying you can't. If you have a problem, please do approach me, uh, and let's work it out. But the pastor may work out the issue with that person, but their family or child may have heard what was said about dad, and they may carry that, and bitterness may grow up out of that. And it's, it's a problem that happens frequently in pastors' homes. Again, I think you guys are amazing. I don't think this is something we're, you know, particularly at this point, stays where we're at. But it's something that we need to constantly be thinking of. Uh, it's a unique position. It's a unique blessing and challenge uh, to be a pastor. And it's so important that I have you praying for me and praying for our church. Uh, pray for the area of uh, protection. 1 Timothy 3, 2-4. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Uh, this whole idea of above reproach. Uh, this would be fault finding. Uh, perfection is not to be expected, or is it? It's not practical to expect perfection out of someone. But when someone is a pastor, how do the people in the community speak of them? Do they say, "Well, yeah, we know that pastor, and and yeah, he's a drunk," or we know that pastor, and every time we go by his house in the summertime, all we hear is screaming and shouting, and the tone that he has with his children, I wouldn't want to live in that house. Again, what, what kind of testimony does this person have? You know, it, it needs to be, we need to pray that they would honor Christ in the way that they live. We should not be surprised when we hear about a leader's moral failure. We should be grieved and brokenhearted by this. And, and sadly, there are too many times every year I, I see the articles come up and another pastor has fallen. But all the more, this should drive us to pray for protection. Because the moment someone steps out and says, I want to be a pastor, they put a target on their back. They're saying, I'm a leader in training, or I'm someone who's trying to lead other people to Christ. I'm trying to lead, wanting to lead a church. And God wants them to grow, and God wants them to succeed, but Satan's attacks are very, very real. So we've got to stand, and we've got to pray for their protection, and for their testimony, and for their life, We've also got to be able to speak up against gossip, against uh, any speech that would threaten the reputation of leaders. And I'm not saying that we just automatically blanket defend them no matter what they've done. We've got to take uh, allegations and accusations seriously. And there has been way too much abuse of power in and covering up in way too many situations. So we've got to balance these things with taking any and all allegations serious, but yet not allowing gossip to enter in and to destroy someone's testimony. Uh, that's, I believe, what Scripture would have us to do. You know, And if they're guilty, yeah, they, it needs to be exposed and they need to be out of the ministry. But if not, they need to be encouraged to continue to walk with Christ and their testimony needs not to be slandered. Pray for the area of their. Uh, oh, sorry. Pray for the area of their physical health. Uh, ministry has some stress, and uh, pastors sometimes are notorious for neglecting their health, uh, neglecting their own well-being, uh, not always eating as healthy as they they're supposed to. Uh, too many church uh, carrying dinners. You know, it, it just 
But some of that also is being temperate. Some of that also is, uh, you know, not overindulging. Uh, you know, it's uh, the, the, the frustrating thing for me sometimes, you know, when's the last time you heard a Baptist pastor preach against gluttony? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and, and there are times where, mm, you know, those chocolate biscuits, <laughs> and those chocolate biscuits get me. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. If I'm not careful, I can easily get out of control with my love for chocolate biscuits or my love for coffee. You know, and on the flip side, I have known pastors who have got out of control with their, they've got to have the beach bod. You know, and they've got they've got to be you know spending three hours in the gym every week, and it's like, or three hours in the gym every day. It's it's you know it, balance. You know, it, it's it's being proper with what God has given us, uh, being good stewards of our physical health, being good stewards of what God has entrusted with us, that we can have a long, healthy ministry. So part of pray for a pastor's health. Paul frequently asked churches to pray for him. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.25. Pray for us. Now if you're looking for a member, uh, I'm sorry, looking for a verse of scripture to memorize, if you struggle in that area, let me encourage you, 1 Thessalonians 5.25. Brother, pray for us. It's also not rocket science. You know, it's it's not, you know, please please explain the hypostatic union. How God is 100%, how Jesus is 100% God, 100% man. No, that's, that's, I, I struggle. Brother, pray for us. That one's a little bit easier. Yet, how frequently do I forget the simple command? If I could just get a hold of the simple commands of Scripture and just be obedient to the simple commands of Scripture, how much better would my life be? Brother, pray for us. Just remembering to pray for the body of Christ. Also, be willing to encourage your, your pastor or your church member's physical fitness. Hey, pastor, want to go for a run? <laughs> Okay, you know, I, I, I might need to get in shape before I can go do that. Or, or, uh, hey, hey, Pastor, uh, let me take those biscuits away from you. You know, let me, within balance. Pray for wisdom. Pray for pastors' wisdom. Pastors have to make dozens of decisions, field multiple questions about Scripture. Life decisions, ministry decisions, having a vision to lead a church. Pray that a pastor would have wisdom. Pray that they would know how to respond and how to counsel well. Pray that they would faithfully and consistently apply God's word and genuinely help people. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Again, where there is no vision, where people don't understand God's word, where people have no clear leading on how to follow and how to obey God's word, they struggle. Again, sheep without a shepherd. Uh, I, I don't have the, I saw the picture, but I don't didn't put the picture in. Uh, have you seen the picture of the sheep that didn't get sheared for about five years? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's just, it's it for some reason, it, it hid out in caves, and it, it just stayed away whenever all the other sheep were being called in to be sheared, and the shepherd, or the sheep, essentially went, uh, I think the shepherd said, about five years before they ever found it once again. And it had, like, so much extra wool, it was carrying like three times its body weight simply in extra wool. Uh, it couldn't hardly see from the amount of wool that was hanging down in front of its own eyes. 
Uh, and it had become very unhealthy just because it hadn't been under the care of the shepherd. You know, because it, it, it spent that much time away. You know, so it's, it's having wisdom. You know, and, and to know where to find and where to tend to the sheep. Pray for the area of provision. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Pray that God would provide for the pastor and for his needs. And I praise the Lord for the way that he has taken care of me and my family. Uh, and also being a missionary, it's somewhat of a unique situation. Uh, because we are funded from the states. Uh, we do not require funding from you to support our family. But the day will come, Lord willing, when there is a British person who will pastor this church when there is someone from the United Kingdom who will pastor this church and it will be this church's responsibility to financially provide for him and his family. That's something that we've got to think about and begin to build in place even now. Now, I can't receive a penny from you, and I don't want a penny from you because, one, that's the way my visa is set up, and two, God has provided through churches in the States for us to be here. But to get things in place for whenever God brings a pastor onto the scene that we can get behind him and we can support him and his family, and we can pray that God would enable us to provide and support them. Verse 17, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. <clears throat> but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. The churches of Philippi, uh, they were the first church uh, that... Paul had actually started, the first missionary church that Paul had actually started, to financially support Paul. And they supported Paul as he went, uh, if I remember right, over to Thessalonica. And Paul then says, uh, everything that happened in Thessalonica is fruit that counts to your account. Every person who came to know Christ as their Savior is a result of your faithful giving to the ministry. And so it accounts to your account. Uh, so that's what Paul was, was praying there. So as a church, when we get behind our pastor, as people come into Christ, as the ministry of the church grows, it's fruit that abounds to our accounts. As we're faithfully involved in the ministry, as the church is the body of Christ and does what it's supposed to do, as God is glorified, we get to rejoice and celebrate with those that have come to know Christ. 1, Thessalonians, or, sorry, 1 Timothy 5, 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Uh, so the, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Uh, it's, it's, the church has the responsibility to provide for the pastor. Now I understand in... British, English, United Kingdom culture, that is something very foreign. Because my understanding, the Church of England vicars are paid from the states. But what does Scripture say? What I'm seeing and what I'm 
teaching here from Scripture is the local New Testament church supports the local New Testament pastor. It's not a government-funded, it's not the way Scripture lays it out. You know, we, we need to make sure we're doing things biblically. So, as I said, this may ruffle a few feathers for people coming from a Church of England background or from people out in the rest of the community who might come into the church later, they they're gonna might have a hard time grasping this. Because, well, you know, I, I pay my taxes and that should provide no, that's not what scripture says. It says the church supports the pastor. Galatians 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him the teacher in all good things. So those being taught the word communicate or give back to the one that is doing the teaching in all good things. Or in, it's, I see it as financial support or just support in general. And again, I thank you for your love and support of me. And with being a missionary, I can't legally receive any funds from you. And I don't want to. You know, that's God has provided for our family very graciously. And we're very, very thankful for the many churches in the United States that fund and provide for us to be here because they want to see people come to know Christ. They want to see New Life Baptist Church established in Telford. And they want to see people come to know Christ in Telford and, and churches started throughout the UK. So that's why we're here. Pray for the opportunity of boldness. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 to 20. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. He says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Pray that your pastor will be bold in witnessing and in sharing the gospel. Pray that we as church members would be bold in witnessing and sharing the gospel with others telling others that they too can receive the forgiveness of their sins, that they too can know that they can spend eternity in heaven if they would simply trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Pray for studying and teaching and preaching the word. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Uh, this is when there was a, the first deacons were appointed. Uh, they had come to the apostles and they had asked and said, you know, the, there's a problem with the serving of tables here. And they said, you find seven men who can do that task. Our job is to continually pray and minister the word. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, uh, Timothy's instructed to take heed unto himself and to, unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. He's told to, to make sure he's taking heed, make sure he's applying scripture to himself, uh, but also make sure he's studying and he, he's sure of what he believes and that he's continuing in that. He's continually studying the word. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Pray that your pastor will have time to study, uh, that he'll have time to get in the word uh, free from distractions and that he will be able to rightly divide and rightly teach. Church leaders cannot do any of these things without the Lord's help. Thus, 
for our church to do what God has called us to do, we as a church, as church members, we have to commit to pray for the church leaders so that they can better serve us as the body of Christ. Uh, and please, I want you to understand, I'm not sitting here just going, you know, it, it, it's all about me because it's not all about me. It's all about Jesus Christ. And what Christ has established is local New Testament churches. And what Christ has put in place is pastors to lead and to instruct and to teach those local New Testament churches as under shepherds, as they follow him and are obedient to him. So really, it all comes back to serving the body of Christ. But it's it goes hand in hand. It's the pastor leading the church. It's the church supporting and caring for and diligently praying for their pastor. It takes both. And again, thank you so much for your care and for your love for me and my family. Uh, it is a blessing to be able to be your pastor uh, and to serve and minister here. Uh, but this is the next step of, of being a church member. You know, it's it's committing, making that commitment to pray for our church leaders and pray that God would raise up someone from within our midst, someone from this country to be the pastor uh, and, and to carry on uh, the ministry. Uh, that's that's what we're here for. So let's pray and then we'll sing our final song today.